All right, let's get started for today. A um, couple of announcements. Your homework three on games is due exceptionally on Tuesday. So you can celebrate President's Day on Monday without having to worry about homework. So exceptionally homework due on Tuesday. Project two, multi-agent Pac-Man has been released. It's due next week, Friday, 5 p.m. The mini contests from now onwards that are associated with the projects that are optional but fun, you should check them out, will be due on Sundays. When the project is due on Friday at 5 p.m., the mini contest will be due Sunday at midnight. There is a great consolidation survey that you should fill out, otherwise we won't have all your grades. Half of your grades live in Panagrader, half of them live in edX. Make sure to check the post on Piazza with the link to the consolidation survey. All right, so I'd like to kind of see what's in the news about AI. Um, some of you might have heard about this about a month ago when the first news came out. The acquisition was now uh, finalized two days ago. Um, Google bought Nest, which is known for its learning thermostat. A thermostat that somehow learns to adapt to behavior you might have and accordingly maybe do better at heating your house, not heating it, not spending too much money on heating costs and so forth. Um, interestingly, this news also ties into today's lecture because one way to approach this kind of problem if you want to design a control system for a thermostat is to model this as a market decision process. And a market decision process is the topic of our um, lecture today. Now, I don't know if that's what they use underneath. They don't tell what they use underneath, but you could get really interesting behavior if you modeled it this way. So let's see what that is. So we're going to look at non-deterministic search problems. Here's an example. You are, let's say, the 188 mascot robot. You want to go fetch the diamond. But to get there, you need to walk along a very narrow path with a fire pit next to the path, and maybe the rocks will crumple as you walk over the rocks, and you'll just fall into the fire pit. You don't know if this is going to happen or not. With some probability, you'll land in the fire pit if you try to go there. With some probability, you don't. And what we'll be looking at is how to solve problems where there is this non-determinism. Okay, let's look at the first concrete example. This will be our running example, grid world. It's a good example to kind of ground the concepts we'll be looking at, but keep in mind, just like for deterministic search, it's not just about solving, finding a path in a maze, it was just a way to illustrate things. Same thing here, grid world is just a way to illustrate the concepts, but market decision processes come in all types. They typically actually have nothing to do with navigating a maze. It just turns out that that's an easy thing to illustrate the concepts with. All right, so in our running example, our agent will live in a grid. Every square in the grid corresponds to a location the agent could be at corresponds to a state. Walls block the agent's path. So for example, you cannot, you cannot be over here. Also, imagine that around these 12 squares, there's a big wall, you can't exit through those walls, you're confined to these 12 squares that you're seeing there. All right, when you take an action, it's non-deterministic now. For example, if the agent decides to take the action north, with 80% chance, indeed, the action north will be executed, but with 20% chance, something else will happen. Half the time when something else happens, you veer off to the left from the direction you want to move, half the time you veer off to the right. Now it is possible that your action or your noisy execution of the action would lead you into a square with a wall. In that case, nothing happens, you stay in place. So for example, if the agent is over here, uh, um, say so agent is here, takes the action east, with 80% chance the action east will be successful, which means they hit a wall and will stay in place. 10% of the time, the action will translate into moving north, and the other 10% of the time that things go wrong, it will become moving south. All right, the agent will receive a reward at each step. So as you 
The agent is in a state, takes an action, lands in a new state, and with that state action, new state process, there's a reward, reward associated. And the reward will depend on the current state, the action, and the next state. In this example here, there's a small living reward. Living reward refers to the concept of something that you get at all times. As long as you're acting in this world, you get this small, negative actually, living reward, which encourages you to finish your task sooner rather than later. Because as long as you're in this world acting, you get this small negative reward, so you'd rather be done sooner than later. Bigger rewards come at the end. There's a plus one over here, and a negative one over here. This MDP also has exit action, so the way, so MDP is the abbreviation for Markov Decision Process, and we'll often just say MDP. Um, if you're in this state here, or this state here, only one action is available to you, and that action is exit. Upon taking the exit action in those squares, that's when you accumulate either the minus one or the plus one reward, and effectively what happens after exit, you land in some kind of done state, which is a 13th state that's not shown on the grid, and then you stay there forever, and you get no rewards anymore, it's just over. All right, the goal, and when we formalize problems this way, is to maximize the sum of rewards. All right, so to contrast this with what we did in lecture two and three, where we had deterministic actions and we're doing things like A star, right? Um, in the deterministic grid world, an agent deciding to move north will just move north. As this, is, this is the current state, then the next state, S prime, will look like this for action north in state S. In a stochastic grid world, after you choose your action, some randomness comes into play. And no coincidence we have a circle node here. This is like what we saw in the expected max trees. Sometimes when there's randomness, you can ex explicitly represent this this way. And that randomness will determine what actually happens next. We know that 80% of the time, so 0.8 probability, this is what happens, but 0.1 and 0.1 for the other two. As we go along in this lecture, you should, you should see a lot of parallels with expected max. In fact, the problems we're going to solve in this lecture are the same types of problems you can already solve with expected max. But we'll look at it from a different point of view and will allow us to solve some problems much more efficiently than we could with, with expected max. Question over there. If, you, if your agent takes deterministic action, so if there are random elements in the world, is that considered a stochastic, uh, stochastic grid world? Um, what we're looking at here, the randomness could either come through the actions or it could come just through the world. You could have a world where the agent, when choosing to move in a certain direction, is guaranteed to move there, but maybe randomly diamonds pop up in certain places with some probability, and then that would be a stochastic aspect of the problem that is not directly the agent doing something noisy, but just the world itself. It can come from anywhere. All right. So the way we formalize this as a mark of decision process, shorthand MDP, is that there's a set of states, we're familiar with that concept, a set of actions, capital A, and then there's a transition function, TSAS prime. And you will need to remember this notation. We'll use this a lot, so make sure to memorize this. TSAS prime stands for the probability that if you take action A, starting from state S, that you then end up in state S prime. Another way to write this is using conditional probability, saying what is the conditional probability of landing in S prime given that the agent was in S and took action A. So this and this are identical. This is the common notation, and we'll use this notation, but keep in mind this is also another way to say the same thing. Often the transition function is called the model or the dynamics of the system. A reward function, R, S, A, S prime. Again, S is the current state, A is the action currently decided to take, and then S prime is the state you land in. That's the general case. It is possible at times that the reward doesn't depend on all three of these. It might be that it only matters where you land, then you have R of S prime. It might only matter where you start from. It might only matter which action you take. Could be many versions, but in general, 
This is the format it'll take on. There is a start state and maybe a terminal state, but not necessarily a terminal state. So these are non-deterministic search problems and in principle, you could attack these problems with Expectimax, at least some of them. Some versions of these, when they might take infinitely long, you might not yet know how to do, but keep your Expectimax intuitions in mind as we go through this. So let's take a look at how this grid world actually plays out. So first demo for today, we have grid world. This is what you saw on the slide with more, more drawings. Dim the top lights, let's see. Um, lighting, medium. That better? All right, thank you. So, what I can do in this demo is, if I press the arrow keys, I choose an action, north, east, south, or west, and then with 80% chance it succeeds, 20% chance it doesn't, something else happens. Clearly the goal here is to get to the one and then take the exit action, right? So let's try to do that. I'm, I'm pressing north, north again, east, 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 and exit. Get the reward of one, game over. All right, so this, this time everything just played out beautifully. Let's try this again. Um, let's go north, North, east, east, and exit. <laughs> Might be a fixed random seed here underneath. Let's uh, try a different path. Let's go east, west, east, west, <laughs> east, west, east, west. No failures, even though the noise level is 20%. There we go, that east didn't succeed. Just stayed in place. Means it turned into a motion that was south, which hit a wall and stayed in place. So sometimes it doesn't succeed. So let's try to go to the one the other way around. So let's go east, east, north, north, stayed in place. Could have been less lucky. It meant we veered off to the left, it hit the wall. Could have just as well veered off to the right, hit the pit. Let's go north again, east, we made it to the goal. So that's, that's how this plays out. Um, That's our grid world. That's where we'll be acting. Just like an expected max, you can only hope to do well on the average. You can't guarantee any particular outcome. So we'll again be optimizing expected utilities. So where does Markov come in this name, Markov decision process? Well, Markov is actually a mathematician from, or statistician from quite a while ago. And whenever you see his name pop up, it usually means that there's an assumption being made about the probability distributions that you are considering. And the assumption is one that the present state the future, sorry, that given the present state, the future and the past are independent. In our case, where is this coming into play? Well, we have, in principle, to compute the distribution over states at time t plus one, you would need to consider everything that's happened in the past because all of what happened in the past could influence your distribution over where you're going to land. But in a Markov decision process, we make the assumption that whatever we call the state and the action together is enough to have the full, to determine the distribution over next states. So we just need the condition on current state and current action to compute our distribution for next time. Whereas in general, keep in mind, in general, the first line is what you need to do, but in a Markov decision process, we make the assumption that we can do it this way. Can you always make this assumption? Well, it depends, but in some sense you can. What if you, say you, had a market, you had some process and things depended on the previous two states and the previous two actions? You just redefine what, mean, what state means for you. And now the new state is this super state that comprises past two states, past two actions, and now there you go, you can then condition that and still have an MDP. So often it comes down to deciding what your state space is such that this is true. Hopefully you can keep your state space small, but it's not guaranteed. All right, so something new we're going to be looking at is a policy. In deterministic planning problems, the output of the planner was a sequence of actions. 
And because things are deterministic, you know how it's going to play out when you execute that sequence of actions. For MDPs, what we're getting back is a policy which will denote by pi. In general, a policy will be denoted by pi. The optimal policy, pi star, um, is the one that gives the highest expected sum of rewards. And a policy maps from states to actions, meaning for any possible state your agent could be in, the policy will say this is the action you should take according to this policy. So this is what a policy could look like for grid world. Everywhere there is shown what to do, and then I guess in these two states, implicitly there is the exit action, the only one you can choose there. The Yama policy is one that maximizes expected utility, and um, once we have the policy, we actually have a reflex agent. Because that table now defines a reflex agent, all you need to do is look up in that table what the right action is, and that's it. That reflex, reflex agent will be rational, will be optimal, because you have solved an MDP to find the optimal policy and then gave that to the agent. How does that compare with Expectimax? Well, in Expectimax, typically what you do is you end up with finding an action for the current state. You run your search, find an action for the current state, then you execute it, you see what, how it plays out, then you're in a new current state, you repeat this process. In some sense, you are executing a policy there too, but it's implicitly defined. It's defined by a procedure. It's not a policy the way we're going to return a policy here that is a nice table that tells you for everything, every state, what, you're ought, to, what you ought to do. In expecting max, you have this implicit policy where you replan after every step. Question there. So the reason that you might run expect max opposed to um, MDP for a chess is because... So... There's a, a great observation there that you can already see here that if you need to represent a policy, you might need a large table, and maybe we might want to run expect max instead because we don't have to build that large policy. That's one way to resolve it. Another way to resolve it is to look at approximate solution methods to MDPs. expect max could be seen as one of them, but once we've seen the MDP solution methods, we'll see that we can make other approximations that aren't exactly the same as the expected max approximation. But you're absolutely right that when the state space is really large, too large to enumerate, the technique we're going to look at today will not work, but it will be the foundation for something that will work. And later in lecture, we'll also see when you benefit from this MDP formalism, when you might benefit from the expected max formalism. All right. So optimal policies, let's say you had a, our grid world and the living reward was minus 0.01. So tiny, tiny negative reward for taking time to get places. All right. Then you can compute the optimal policy using a technique that we'll see later in lecture and this is what the optimal policy is. All right, let's look at a couple of states here. This one here makes sense. You wanna to move towards that plus one. This whole top row makes a lot of sense. This makes a lot of sense. This makes sense because this path is a safer path than the other path, even though they're equally long. Now, what's going on here? It's designed to move into the wall. That means with 80% chance that it succeeds, it moves into the wall and stays in place. With 10% chance, moves down. 10% chance, moves up is the only action you have available there that absolutely guarantees you to not land in the pit. It's a slow way to get out of there because you might be bumping into that wall many, many times, but the living reward, the penalty you get here is rather limited, so you're willing to spend the time to play it safe and keep bumping into that wall until you finally happen to get out by chance. The noise is working in your favor here in some sense. What if you bump up the penalty for spending time, so we have now minus 0.03. Well, now the action here changes. We want to move up. Down here, it's still better to go around and take a longer path. We can bump the cost for taking time even more. Now, everywhere, the shortest path is favored, and if you have two shortest, path, two shortest paths, you pick the one that's safest. What happens if we bump it even more? Minus two. Now the living reward, the penalty you get, is worse than the best reward you can get over here. So actually, if you're close to the pit, you just jump into the pit. 
because that's just minus one, whereas living gives you minus two, and any anytime you extend your life, that's a bad thing in this scenario. All right, let's look at another example just to highlight that it's not just about grid worlds. Let's look at racing. So a robot car wants to travel far quickly. There are three states. The car could be cool, warm, or overheated. All right, so a blue, red, and a burned out car. Two actions. Slow and fast. Of course, once it's overheated, that's the exit state. That's where you can't do anything anymore. You're stuck forever. Um, but from the cool and the warm situation, you can either go slow or fast. And this is what the transition model looks like. So let's parse this. From cool, if you take the slow action, you're guaranteed there's a probability of one to stay cool, to be cool at the next time. If you take the fast action from a cool car, then half the time the car remains cool, half the time it becomes warm. If you're in the warm state and you go fast, then with probability one, you overheat the car and you're done playing this game. If you ever take the slow action, then half the time the car stays warm, half the time it, it becomes a cool car again. All right, so that's how the MDP works in terms of transitions. Then there are rewards associated with all of these, right? Going faster, we'll assume, gives us double the reward. So there is a good thing in going fast. You get more reward, but the downside is, of course, if you go fast, once you're in the warm state, then you're done, so reward stops coming in. So the rewards are annotated in green here, plus one for all the slow actions, and plus two for the fast actions, and then minus 10 if the fast action lands you into the overheated state. All right. So we can model this if we want to solve this with a search tree. A lot, lot. This is an expected max problem, right? So we can set it up this way. Um, initially, we have a cool car, let's say. Then we could take one of two actions, slow or fast. If we pick slow, car stays cool. If we pick fast, the car could become warm or might stay cool. And then this process repeats. This is what it would look like if we got to pick actions twice. So a depth two game. This looks like expect the max. It is expect the max, in fact. Um, but it's also an MDP that we just modeled. And so let's look very explicitly at where MDPs kind of live in this expect the max tree. So a maximizer node is a state in the MDP. Then you get to take an action. That's from your action set in the MDP. Then you land in what is called a Q state. This is a chance node in Expectamax. We call it a Q state when we're working with MDPs. It's annotated by a state and an action. At that point, chance kicks in. You have a random transition. You land in your next state, S prime, which could be typically any of many next possible states. And then this process repeats. What's different from Expectamax? The only difference really is that Rewards are sitting on these transitions. So rewards are associated with this entire S A S prime process, right? In Expectamax, you just had utilities all the way at the end. Here you have them on the transitions and you sum them as you go along. It's a really minor difference. We could easily adapt the Expectamax algorithm to propagate up the sum of things it encounters along the way rather than just propagating up what's at the bottom. In fact, in your project two, you will be summing things up along the way as you propagate things up. All right. Before we can really dive into this, um, so far I've said that we'll sum the rewards, but last lecture, at the end of lecture, we saw that there's this thing called utilities. Maximizing expected utilities actually makes sense. There's this theorem that if we're willing to accept that set of five actions, tells us that there are these numbers called utilities, if we maximize expected utilities, that's the right thing to do. So why can we just sum these rewards is the question right now. So we have utilities of sequences we now need to evaluate. Rather than one the utility of one particular state, we need to say how good is it to have a sequence of states. All right. So let's say you could get a sequence of rewards, because that's really what it is. All right. It's not the state here. It's abstracting two rewards, what you care about. So do you want more or less reward? More, that's the way we set up the problem. More reward is always better. So if you have two sequences, one, two, two, if 
versus 2, 3, 4. 2, 3, 4 is the better choice. Do you want it now or later? Let's see, between two options here, option A versus option B, who prefers option A? A couple of minorly half raised hands. Who prefers option B? Why to prefer option B? You never know what happens. It's sometimes a justification that you're bringing up, right? It's good to get it sooner. In general, um, between these choices, it's, not, it's maybe not the uncertainty that comes into play, but just the fact that getting things sooner is often preferable. If I gave you a billion dollars today, or the day before you die, you might prefer today, right? It's still the billion dollars. Even just from an economic point of view, what if you get money today versus later in time? Most of the time, if you get the money earlier, you can in principle invest it, make it into more money. And so by the time it's a few days later, you have more money than you started out with. So it's good to get things earlier. All right, so how are we going to encode that? We're going to use something called discounting. And so with it, it's reasonable to maximize the expected sum of rewards. That's all good. But if you prefer rewards now to rewards later, then you can let reward, the way you sum them up, discount rewards that come in later. And you discount them exponentially. So you would say, a diamond right now is worth one. A diamond at the next time is worth only gamma, where gamma for us will typically be a number between zero and one. So in principle, it could be one or zero, but between zero and one is usually the most meaningful. Gamma squared, if you only get it two steps later, and so forth. So we now have a way of summing rewards that come in over time where later ones get discounted. And because gamma lies between zero and one, the higher the exponent over here, the lower the number. All right, so now if we look at our expected max visualization of the process that's going on, we have this discounting happening over here, and so reward that gets accumulated over here gets scaled by one, but then the next one gets scaled by gamma, next one by gamma squared. If you keep going, gamma to the third and so forth. Um, why do this? One justification that often comes up is the economic justification. Just there's something called interest, right? You can actually show that um, having a discount factor of gamma corresponds to having, thinking of your money being able to accrue an interest of one over gamma minus one per time step. So there's something there, right? And so this case, right, the closer gamma to one, the less that interest is, the less you care about needing to get your money right away. And the closer gamma to zero, the more you want your rewards right now, and also the interest, equivalent interest rate will be higher. Another reason that's often you, you, that we use gamma very often is just it helps our algorithms converge. It'll turn out once we look at agents that might act infinitely long, having this gamma in there that lies between zero and one will allow us to find solutions, even though in principle, this infinitely long thing, you might think that can't solve that, it's infinitely deep tree, thanks to discounting, things at the bottom will be discounted by so much that they become negligible. And so you effectively have a finite tree in some sense. All right, so could be anywhere between zero and one. Here's just an example of how this plays out. You can also start computing things. So you can compute the utility of one, two, three versus three, two, one. And one, two, three will be preferred. You can start computing more detailed things. You can say, how about three, two, one versus two, three, two, then it gets a little more complicated. Might need to do a, compu a computation here. All right, there's an assumption we're going to make that's going to justify why we can, why we can do this. We're not gonna get into the details of actually justifying it, just like last time we didn't see the proof of the theorem that there are these utilities, but we're just going to state it here. Let's assume stationary preferences. Think of this as something in addition to the actions we had last time with, we had five actions now. Here's something else. Assume stationary preferences. What does that mean? It means that if you prefer a sequence of rewards, A1, A2, and so forth, over B1 followed by B2 and so forth, then you also prefer this sequence of rewards over this sequence of rewards. What is this saying in words? If you prefer a sequence of rewards starting, starting today, 
then you just as well prefer that sequence of rewards if it starts tomorrow, as long as we get today is the same between the two things you're choosing between. So R is what you get today, stays the same, then the future matches with this over here, then you will have the same preference here. That's the assumption of stationary preferences. If you're willing to assume this, then it turns out that you can show that these are the types of, this is the way you can compute your utility over sequences of rewards. They're effectively the same. You can either just add them up or you can add them up with discounting. Note that implicitly this also means, so if you think about this, what this is going to mean is if your preference over rewards is the same, whether it's now or tomorrow or the day after and so forth, that means that if you're, let's say, an agent in the grid world, and you're sitting in a particular state, it doesn't matter how long you've already been busy in that grid world. When you're in a particular state, your preferences are the same no matter when you landed in that state, and the optimal thing will always be the same thing no matter when you are in that state. So really we need only one action for each state to encode our optimal policy. If you don't have stationary preferences, that doesn't need to be the case. If they're not stationary, then as your preferences change, it's effectively your reward is changing all over the map, for example, then you might not do the same action in the same state if you land there at a different time. All right, so let's do a little quiz here to make sure that we all get this down. Um, very small gri grid world. There are two actions, east and west, in states B, C, and D. States A and E have only one action, the exit action, after which you go to a done state where everything's over. And through that transition, you get a reward of 10 if you came out of A, one if you came out of E. So let's do a little quiz here. Um, first question. So, and we assume that transitions are deterministic here, just to make it easier to compute what's going to happen. So, for gamma equal to one, what is the optimal policy here? What will you do in each of these states? So really the three that matter are these three here, the other two you only have one option available. For gamma equals 0 0.1, what will you do in these three states? And is there a choice of gamma such that East and West are equally good when you are in state D. Let's take a one minute break and see if you can come up with the answers. All right, let's see what we got here. For gamma equal to one, what is the open policy? I would call it West, but I think you, everybody meant West. So West is going this direction. Because there's no discounting really, right? Gamma equal to one is the same as no discounting. So you just want to get as much reward as possible. It's okay to get it a little later. If you start close to the one, you're still willing to make the three moves to get to the 10 and then take the exit action, finally get the 10. What if gamma equals 0 0.1? Now it gets trickier, right? You need to think about whether it's worth it to move all the way. So let's look at this node here, this state here, west or east? West, easy decision, right? The 10 is closest and it's better, so for sure that's the way to go. Middle state, again easy because it's a tie in terms of distance and the 10 is better. But this one here, we need to do a little bit of computation, right? How much do we get, how much do we get for continuing to move west versus how much do we get for moving east? For east we would get one step with zero reward and then the next step would be the exit action. So east would give us zero plus gamma times one, and gamma is 0 0.1, so we get 0 0.1. For west, we will get zero here, zero here, zero here, and then 10 on the exit action, so we get zero plus gamma times zero plus gamma squared times zero plus gamma to the third times 10 which is equal to 0 0.001 times 10, which is 0 0.01. So 0 0.01 is worse, it means it's not worth spending that time under this assumption of discount factor to go all the way west. You'd prefer to instead go east and get the reward sooner. When do we get a tie? When are they equally good? 
for the D state? Well, any thoughts? Any numbers somebody wants to throw out there? One? One divided by? One divided by root of 10 is one suggestion. Any other suggestions? Agreement with that, with gamma equals 1 over square root of 10, and also gamma equal to 0 will get us ambivalence. Somewhat of a trivial solution, but I guess the kind of solution we always need to make sure to avoid when we ask you exam questions. Um, <laughs> any other suggestions? Okay, now let's see how we get the 1 over square root of 10. So we're looking for a tie over here. If from here we go west, 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 exit, we get, as we saw, 0 plus gamma times 0 plus gamma squared times 0 plus gamma to the third times 10. If we go the other way, we get, we want this to be equal, so we get 0 plus gamma times 1. The zeros don't really do much. So we have gamma to the third times 10 equals gamma, which is gamma squared times 10 equals 1. So we have gamma squared equals 1 over 10. Get rid of the square here, put it on the other side, and we're done. So 1 over square root 10 was the right number. Well done. Okay, now that we know what discounting is, we can start worrying about infinite utilities. What if the game lasts forever? Do we get infinite rewards? Well, if you had no discounting, what would happen, right? If it could last forever, and on every step you could get a reward somehow, or at least on a reasonable fraction of the steps you could get a reward, then things would add up to infinity if these rewards are bounded away from zero, and that'd be tricky to work with. So one solution to deal with that is just to go find on horizon. Say, look, I don't really need to think, build an agent that will act infinitely long. I'm only going to live another 100 years. Um, let's bound it by that, or maybe even something shorter, because my robot will break down anyway much sooner than 100 years. All right. So you can have some horizon that you think is reasonable and just work with that. The downside of that is that you end up with non-stationary policies. Because once you bound the horizon, things start changing once you get closer to the end of the game, right? Because as you're hitting close to the end, well, only so much time left, right? If you only had one step left, you're next to the one, you're going to want to take the one. Whereas if you had more steps left and, in this case, no discounting, you could just move to the 10 on the other side. So now it gets more complicated. A policy now becomes indexed by state and how much time is left. But sometimes it can be the right thing to do. So that's, by the way, what we mean, what we mean with non-stationary policies is that usually we have pi of s, but that now becomes pi of s and time left. All right, you could use discounting. Why will that work out? If your discount factor lies strictly below one, and we're not gonna let it be zero, um, because then everything is the same, it's not an interesting MDP if your discount factor is zero, um, then the utility of your sequence of rewards from time zero through infinity is the sum of each of the rewards discounted according to what time you get that reward. We know that is bounded by R max over one minus gamma. Why is that true? Let me work that out in a little more detail. We have sum t equals zero to infinity, gamma to the t, RT. If RT is smaller than or equal to some maximum reward, then we have that this is sum t equals zero to infinity, gamma to the t, R max. Well, R max is a constant, so we can consider this just separately. This is a geometric series. I'm not going to prove that this sums to one over one minus gamma, but it does. This is equal to one over one minus gamma, which hopefully you've seen somewhere else. If not, feel free to come talk to us in office hours or on Piazza. And so here's the bound we have. So we know that no matter what sequence of actions and transitions you end up with, the sum of discounted rewards is bounded. Gamma has a meaning, so beyond it helping you getting finite values, 
you now also have an emphasis on getting things sooner, which you might want or might not want. Sometimes it's an artifact. Sometimes you say, well, I want to have a stationary policy. Um, I, I want to, so I want to have this infinite horizon MVP. Um, I don't really want to discount, but if I don't, then this doesn't work out. So then you pick some gamma that's super close to one and find the optimal policy under that setting. And you hope it's close enough to one for your purposes if you really didn't care about discounting. All right, another thing that you could have in your MDP is an absorbing state. If it's such that there's some state, once you land in that state, for example, the grid world had this and the car world had this, once you land there, things are over and rewards from then onwards are always zero. And if it is true that if you act long enough with probability one, you'll end up in that state. How do you guarantee this? Well, for example, if there is, every transition is noisy, and you can maybe, and then that means that you could, by some chance, execute a random walk that gets you into that sync state, and so there's some finite probability you get in there over a finite horizon, and then as time goes by, that probability will just add up over time, and you'll end up with, if you act infinitely long with probability one, you land in the sync state, and actually the expected sum of rewards will be finite. Even though there would be, in this case, there could be specific state action sequences that lead to infinite rewards, the expected sum of rewards for any policy will be finite. All right, clearly this is the easier case to be dealing with and it's the case we'll mostly be working with. All right, let's take a break here and after the break, let's take a look at how we can solve these problems. All right, let's uh, restart. Any questions about the first half of lecture? All right, let's do a quick re recap of MDPs then, make sure we have the notation in our minds and then we can start looking at how to solve them. Capital S is a set of states S subscore uh, subindex zero is the start state. Capital A is a set of actions. The transition model can be written either as TSAS prime or PS prime conditioned on S and A. Its meaning was what's the probability of landing in S prime at the next time, given you are currently in S and took action A. And then there's a reward R, which depends on the current state S, current action A, next state S prime, and a discount factor gamma. So the quantities we're interested in are a policy, ideally the optimal policy, which tells us for every state what the right action is to take, where right means the action that will help us maximize the expected sum of rewards, and the utility that we're using, as we said, is this sum of discounted rewards. All right. So solving MDPs means that somehow we'll find something that looks like this, which is the right thing for our MDP. Some op optimal policy. Let's define the quantities we'll need to uh, later define an algorithm. So first quantity is the value or the utility of a state S, denoted by V star of S. It's the expected utility starting in S and acting optimally. Keep in mind, I haven't said how you compute this, but you should understand what this means, right? This is the highest expect, expected sum of rewards you can possibly get. If you were to act optimally, V star S is your expected return. On the average, if you get to act many times starting from S, and you do it optimally, you'll get V star S. That's associated with the regular states. We know we also have these Q states over here, which are indexed by state and action. Q star S A, is the expected utility starting out having taken action A from state S and thereafter acting optimally. So in this case, the first action is fixed. It's action A. After that action has been taken, from then on you act optimally, then Q star SA is your expected sum of discounted rewards. The optimal policy, pi star S, is the optimal action from state S. 
you can already see some relationships here, right? For state S, we'll have V star S will be the max over all A of Q star S A, right? Because V star is if you act optimally from right now, and Q star is looking at if you first take action A and then optimally. One of these actions A, the best one, is the optimal one, and that Q star value for the best action A in state S will correspond to V star S. Pi star of S will correspond to this. I mean, some notation we'll see a lot later, but um, it's, we can write this as arg max over A Q star S A. What does that mean? It means we're maximizing over A, so we pick the best action, state S according to the Q values, but rather than returning what the value is for that best action, which would be V star of S, we return the action that achieves it. That's what this notation means here. The arg max means that you're still solving a maximization, but you don't return the maximum, you return the argument that achieves the maximum. All right, so let's take a look at what these can look like in our grid world. So we have a second demo here. Here are the values after 100 iterations in our grid world. It's for some setting of the living reward, um, for some setting of the discount factor and so forth. But let's just make sure we can interpret this and they make sense. So the top here, the one, the only action available is exit, so the optimal thing to do is to take that one action that's available, gives you expected sum of rewards of one, that's it. Same thing for this minus one. How about this one here, the 0 0.93? How does that come about? That's saying, that's showing V star of that state. It's saying that if you act optimally, and it's actually showing what it thinks that is, which means moving off to the right, from then onwards, which means after that first move, you still keep acting optimally, your expected sum of rewards is 0 0.93. Why is it not one? Well, because rewards are discounted, and you'll get the reward later. There is some noise, so as you move to the right, you might actually move down, and you see here that if you're in the square below, you try to move up, which means there's some chance you move off to the right and fall into the pit. Still, this happens to be the optimal thing to do for this particular scenario, because there's a certain amount of discounting, so you want to get the reward soon, there's a certain living reward that penalizes you, and so this happens to be the optimal policy and the values that you see is the expected return. Over many runs on the average, that's what you'll get. So each state has its own value. Yes? Do you start these at a random percentages or how? These are the values. We haven't said how you get them. These are the result of a computation that we're about to see how to do. Let's also take a look at the Q values. Now we have four values per state, because there are four actions in each state, except for the exit states. So here, for example, what do we see? We have four values, one for each action. The 0 0.93 is what we saw before. That's the optimal value. The highest one of these four is always going to correspond to V star. So for example here, the highest one is 0 0.68, there's actually a tie. We, the one that's kind of brighter white is the highest one, and that's what we saw in the previous um, drawing where we just saw the values. You can read all the policy from this, right? If you were to store the Q star values, you can read out the policy. You can say, well, these are the Q star values for this state. Let's check which of these is the highest, the 0 0.73. So moving west is the optimal thing to do from that state. If, however, you decided to move, let's say, east, the expected discounted sum of rewards is 0 0.67, only a little bit lower than the 0 0.73. Um, so you do know with these Q values if you did something suboptimally at first, but from then onwards optimally, what you were on expectation going to get. So this 0 0.67 corresponds to if you first would move east, then you would be here with some chance. If you were here, you'd move back west because that's optimal. Moving east doesn't necessarily succeed, you might stay in place. At the next time, you would move west because that's optimal. 
and you might move down, which keeps you in place, and again, next time you move west. So this Q value here, 0 0.67, means taking just an action right now, not changing that state's policy. No, just right now, you change the action you take there, and from then, from then onwards, if you were to ever visit the state again, you would be again taking the optimal action. All right, and so this is what it would look like if you were to act according to this policy, and usually you'd land in the state you want to be in, but it's not guaranteed. You saw one go in the pit there. All right, so we now know the quantities. Um, let's now look at a recursive definition of value. So, V star, actually let me write, build this up as we go along. So V star, for state S, is the max over all actions available in state S over Q star SA. That's what we do in this node over here in expected max. This is just a standard expected max operation. Right? So far we've never done anything different really from expected max. It's forthcoming what we'll do different. Then if we're in a expected node, we need to compute a Q value, Q star SA, is equal to, and now, there's a distribution over outcomes. So we need to average sum over all possible next states S prime. The probability of landing in S prime when we take action, sorry, this probability of, when you start in state S, take action A, you land in S prime. That's the weight we give to that transition. Times, and then we need to multiply it with, if we just put here, V star of S prime, that'd be expected max, right? We say the value of this Q state is the average of the values of the states we land in where we weight accordingly. And in MDP, we've changed things a little bit. We've added a reward for the transition, so we actually have to include the reward R S A S prime, and we might have some discounting. So it looks like this now. You can also write this out in one go. You can write V star S as max over A sum over S prime T S A S prime R S A S prime plus gamma V star S prime. So fundamentally, we're not doing much new here. We're just adding a reward on the transition. There are a lot of new symbols. You might wonder, I already understood this before, expect a max. What are these symbols doing here? Do I need to know them? And the answer is yes, you really need to understand what these equations are saying. Because in the next few lectures, we're going to build on top of this. These symbols are going to keep coming back and back. We're going to come up with tweaks to the algorithm we're seeing today, various variants. And if you don't, if when you see this, you just don't immediately know what's going on then you're not going to be able to follow in the next three lectures. So whenever you see something like this, you should understand, oh yeah, maximizer node in the, in the tree, maximizing over actions, the, then this Q star corresponds to the chance node. You see this equation, you should understand what's going on. It's computing the value of a state action pair. You know, question there? Um, you know that this is a chance node, you have to average, that's what's happening over here. And what are you averaging? Well, the instantaneous reward plus a discount factor times what's going to come in the future. And even this equation should be clear to you. What's the value of a state S? The op expected, optimal expected sum of rewards with discounting? Well, corresponds to taking the best action that you currently have available. And the way you know what's best is by looking at the Q star SA values, which are then sitting over here. Right, we have a typeset over here. So at this point, we have something we can associate with each of these nodes. We can say there's a V star of S here, there is a Q star of SA over here, there's a V star of S prime over here, and so forth. For our car example, this is what it could look like. All right. Keep in mind, we don't play this game just for two turns. We're going to be playing this for a long time. So really, what it looks like is more something like this. 
and it keeps going down here. So that's what we want to try to solve now. We want to try to solve these types of problems that might go really, really deep. Hold your thought for just a minute. One main thing to observe here, though, is that if you carefully look at this tree and you say, well, what, is, what do we have here? This is V star of cool. It's what we'd want to end up with, right? Over here, we also have V star of cool. Same thing over here, V star of cool, and so forth. Same thing here, this, 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 and this, those are all the same. So we have a lot of repetition in this tree. Like what's happening underneath here is the same thing as what's happening here, same thing as what's happening here, same thing as what's happening here, same thing as what's happening here. A naive expected max search would not be aware of that and would independently run through all of those and do a lot of extraneous work. And this is where you can see where the benefit of what we're going to do is going to come in. It's going to come in whenever the state space is relatively small, at least in the form we're going to look at it right now, relatively small state space compared to the size of this expected max tree. In this expected max tree, expect max tree will have a lot of repetition if the state space is relatively small. And one thing you could do is you could say, well, all we need to do is do some caching. But it turns out there's a cleaner way of doing it where we don't have to set up any caching and so forth and we can do a bottom-up dynamic programming approach to solving this very efficiently. Yes? Um, this seems very similar to alpha beta pruning. Is it the same sort of concept or? Um, can I take it a level up? The question is what can we relate it to in previous lectures, right? Alpha beta pruning was interesting because it was meta computation, right? You could say, I know I don't need to consider this part of the tree because it's not going to affect my result. Here's another type of meta computation. You know this is something you already computed, you don't have to recompute it. That being said, I would argue it's more similar to graph search. Remember in graph search we had a tree and we might have repeated states and we knew that what's underneath there is identical if, if you start from the same state and we said we don't need to repeat that work. But at the higher level, yes, meta computation both for alpha, beta and here. All right, so this is the tree we just were looking at. If you run expect the max, Clearly we do too much work. Um, states are repeated, and the main idea we're going to explore is compute needed quantities only once. There's still a problem though. This tree still goes on forever. We haven't resolved that yet. But we do know if we do discounting, things really deep in the tree matter less and less the deeper you are because of the discounting. So eventually things stop mattering and maybe we only need a certain depth of the tree. Okay, so let's look at time-limited or depth-limited values. Um, so let's say VKS is, again, a new piece of notation. This will keep coming back. VKS is the optimal value of, if you are in state S, act optimally with K more time steps left. So think of it as you're in state S, think of this being at the top of your expected max tree, and your tree is only, S, is only K deep. All right. So that's like depth k expect the max would give us the value, right? So let's say we're at depth two, could look like this. Depth two expect the max would give us the value for state s. And we'll denote it like this. We'll say, okay, well, the value with two steps left for that particular state can be computed by doing something with this expect the max tree. We'll start doing different things later, but conceptually that's what's going on. Let's look at a demo illustrating what happens as we increase depth in our grid world. Let's get to your question after the demo. Um, so this is our grid world. Depth zero optimal values are all zeros because with zero time steps left, no rewards are accumulated, everything's zero. Think about what they would look like for depth one. Are any states going to have a non-zero value? Yes, the states from where you can exit and only exit will have a non-zero value, one and minus one. All the others will still be zero. There's no way from any of those states with one step to accumulate any reward at all. As we go along, now it's a two-step problem. We see that this propagates out. Now there's another state with a non-zero value. Um, why, is, why is this one here still zero? 
Well, if there's only two steps left, you actually can reach the point over there, so actually the optimal action would be to move off west and stay in place, so this will still be zero. Even though you could get a negative value taking a poor sequence of actions, the optimal policy with two steps left will actually move left over here, so west, and stay in place and then get zero, not the minus one at some point. With three time steps left, this is what we get as values, four, and this is typical in MDPs if rewards are localized in a certain set of states, and there's a connectivity pattern to the state space, you'll see the values as your depth limit increases propagate out from where you get the rewards to the other states, and they'll get there once you can actually get to the reward states. So we get non-zero, in this case after six iterations, all states have a non-zero value. Does that mean we're done? Doesn't mean we're done. This is just for a depth six. If we wanna play longer, we need to keep computing. We have a deeper tree now, depth seven, and these values keep changing. Now, one interesting thing you'll notice here is as, as we build a deeper and deeper expect the max tree, the values don't keep changing. <coughs> There's a convergence here. Once you are acting, let's say, 20 times step long, whether it becomes 21 or 22 or even more, the value effectively remains the same because of the discounting. Because things that are beyond that far out, within two decimals, just these things don't show up. Because they're too small a number to show up on this representation. Yes? So as we increase the iterations, particularly from, I think, about one to seven iterations, are uh, the square that's in the upper right hand corner next to the gold square change significantly? Why does the value increase if it's only one time step next to the gold? Um, why does the value increase as, as we go along here? So let's, let's restart this, all right? So you're, you're observing that, I guess, the first step is clear. The second step is also clear, right? The 0.72 effectively comes from 80% chance success to go to the one, a discount factor of 0.9, which together combines for 0.72. Now the reason this one still keeps increasing is that if in those 20% chance of non-success, if you have more time, you can still potentially make it to the goal and that's why it keeps increasing. So that's why we get higher and higher values as we go along. Great observation. Do you have your question? Yeah, uh, my original was, so can we just make a trigger on the change when it, the value stops changing by a certain amount? Absolutely, so you could, you could run this right and you could say, well, once I search deeper, and going deeper doesn't change the values within machine precision of my machine, let's say, who knows, 64-bit machine and nothing changed. You could say, well, I think I'm done, that's enough precision for me, and going deeper is just gonna keep you, giving you the same values, at least on your machine, unless you implement your own multiple float or multiple double computation. All right, so these are also on the slide, so you can look at them offline if you want. So we want to compute these time-limited values. As we do this in this expect the max tree, we want to not recompute things that we already computed. So let's look at this as a one, two, three, four, five, depth five. Zero time steps left. We just need to compute three values. Even though there are a lot of leaves to this tree, there's only three types. There's cool, warm, and broken down. In fact, when there's zero time steps left, all three of them will have a zero value. That's what you can put there. As you move up a layer in the tree, what appears there? Again, only three types of states appear. It's cool, warm, and broken, but now with one time step left. So for each of these three, you look at that little expect the max tree that has to just look one step down because you already know the values at the next state and just do a quick expect the max computation to get out the values V1 for cool, V1 for warm, and V1 for broken. Next, next level, same thing. Just for three states, you have to compute values. Same thing here, and then the last one, it's a little simpler in principle, you can just compute it for the, for the cool state. 
So this is all we need to do. We need to just compute the updates we've seen on the previous slides for those particular states. So rather than having the exponential explosion with depth of the tree in terms of computation, we work from the bottom to the top and start with zero time steps left, keep working our way up, and for every state, compute only once in any given layer. All right, this is called value iteration. What I just showed to you is value iteration for a finite horizon. So you start with V0 for every state equal to zero. No, no time steps left means an expected reward sum of zero. Then recursively you assume that you have the values for K time steps left for all states. Then to get the values for K plus one time steps left, that's what you're doing. You solve this expected max tree with K plus one time steps, state S at the root node, Take any other set of actions, then there's a stochastic transition, and then you land in a state S prime with k time steps left, for which we already know the solution of the subtree. We computed that in the previous iteration. And that, the way we do this entire update here is with this equation over here. It's often called the Bellman update equation. That's what you do. And you repeat this until convergence. As we saw, this is computing Values for zero times it's left, one times it's left, two left, and so forth. And at some point, this starts converging because the contributions of having more time steps are so minimal that it converges to the actual value for infinitely many time steps. Complexity of each iteration, you need to look at all pairs of states and for each state, also look at the action. So you have S squared times A in terms of complexity per iteration. Number of iterations here, well, in principle, to be fully converged, that it's a series, right? It's an infinite thing that you look at. You only get the exact number at infinite precision if you do this infinitely long. In practice, if you work with a finite precision, it'll depend a lot on your discount factor, right? The closer your discount factor to one, the longer this will take in practice until you're converged for all practical purposes. If your discount factor is close to zero, you might, might take very few of these iterations until you are, for all practical purposes, converged. All right, so there's a theorem that this will converge to the unique optimal values. Um, let's take a look at how that works out. So here we have our update equation. We have our car example, and let's solve it, at least for part of the recursion. At time, with zero time steps left, the values are all zero. With one time step left, well, if you're broken down, still zero. In fact, we know that from there it's always zero. Then if you are in the cool um, state, you could take any of two actions. If you take the slow action, then you get a reward of plus one with probability one. At the next time, you get zero, so you end up with one plus zero. If you take the fast action, then with probability 0 0.5, you get a reward of plus two. So 0 0.5 times two. And with 0 0.5, actually, either way, you get a reward of plus two. You might just land in different states afterwards. So either way, you also get, you get two here. So taking the fast action is the right thing to do with one time step left, and the value here is two. So this one here was Q1, cool, slow, and this one here is Q1, cool, fast, which happens to be the higher one of the two, and so that's also equal to <laughs> Q star one. Um, all right, now both of them are Q star one. This happens to be equal to V star, one step left for state cool. All right, what if we're in state warm? Two actions available, fast and slow. Let's first look at the fast one. For fast, we get a reward of minus 10. And then after that, we land in the overheated state where the value, this part here, is zero. So overall, we get minus 10. Then if we took the action slow, with probability 0 0.5, we get one. And staying warm with 0 0.5, we get one and transition to cool. 
After the transition, we know what's left is zero, so either way we get 0 0.5, and that's the optimal thing to do here. So 0 0.5 is our value here. Let's go a layer up, we can keep doing this. Let's say we are in the warm state. If we take the action, let's first look at this one here, the action fast. Fast means we get so Q2 warm fast is equal to, well, there's only one transition that can happen. So the sum over next states is just one next state with probability one. We get a reward of minus 10 plus gamma, whatever gamma might be, times whatever the value is of the next state, and the next state is the broken down state, so that's zero. So here we get a, for fast, we get a uh, minus 10. We can do the same thing for slow. We have a couple of videos online where you can see how we step through these examples. And so you just kind of work through each one of them, see what the value is going to be, and then see which one is highest among the Q values. That's your V star value, and you keep going. All right, so in this case, we end up with the following values. So 2 and 1, then 3.5, 2.50. In principle, you can keep going. At some point, will they converge here? It depends. This was computed without a discount factor. So without a discount factor, actually, this is not going to converge here. Because, for example, you can get infinite reward by always doing slow, and that means the optimal thing is at least infinity. But if you had a discount factor, then this would converge and you'd get some finite values. All right, so this convergence thing, how does that work? How do we prove this convergence? Well, if the tree actually has a finite depth, the game is over at some point that you're playing here, then of course that's straightforward. There is some value you get and that's it. What if the discount is less than one but the tree is infinite? Let's consider two cases. This is, we're computing vk of s, and here vk plus one of s. Let's think very carefully about what's different between these two computations. vk of s runs still here, depth k. vk plus one runs still here, depth k plus one. What's different about them? Well, you can extend this tree over here for vk with this white layer and have all rewards equal zero in that white layer. Now that's also depth k plus one tree. It's not the same one as the one we have on the right, but it's depth k plus one, and it's actually not all that different. Everything here is the same. The only difference is at the bottom here. If you compute the value over here, right, so let's say bottom to top, being smart about not computing for a single state more than once in any given layer. What is the final contribution of things in the bottom layer here? They are k plus one steps deep. So if you look at the value here, the contribution of whatever is down here will be discounted by a factor gamma to the k. This could be multiplied by something as large or as r max or as small as r min, the minimum and the maximum reward you might ever get. But that's the only difference. That's the only difference between those trees. So if k is large enough, the difference between those trees will become minimal in that the values you compute, the difference in values is only caused by that layer over here and the contribution of that layer as k goes to infinity will go to zero because gamma to the k will go to zero as k goes to infinity. And that's the proof idea here is that the maximum difference between vk and vk plus one is gamma to the k times max absolute value of r. Well, that means that as k goes to infinity, the difference between vk and vk plus one goes to zero, which means that vk and vk plus one become the same as k is large enough, which means we have convergence. <laughs> All right, next time we'll look at policy-based methods, which is a different way of trying to solve these MDPs. All right, that's it for today.